Father, thank you so much for the goodness of the Word. I thank you that the Word of God just overrides everything in us. It overrides our emotions, our health. Our, it, it brings us the contentment of life that we need. Tonight, as we break bread together and we go through this, I pray that we go through it with clarity. I pray we go through it with understanding. And it causes us to think about things we've learned or heard or even not heard. I bless it, Holy Spirit, come breathe upon your word now in Jesus' precious name. And you say amen. Have you enjoyed kingdom versus kingdom? Good, good, good. Well, we'll start a brand new topic in January. I've got several brewing, so I won't, I won't bore you with giving them all, but it's going to be good as we continue to move forward, and I know you'll be blessed. Tonight, we're wrapping it up called All Things New. We're going to go through the book of Revelation together, and I kind of gave you some instances of looking at all the twos that are there, two of this, two of that, two of this. I do want to tell you that uh, there may be people that disagree with things I tell you tonight because it's very hard a lot to teach revelation and find a consistency of belief because there's so many different beliefs about the end, about the rapture, about the kingdom, uh, is revelation's future, is revelation already passed, and we can argue it all day long. I'm not an arguer, but I do love to debate, so I never mind you asking me questions. I never mind you saying I disagree with you or that you have a different opinion. It makes for a good, healthy debate together as we open the Word. So I just want to give you that preface as we get into it tonight. Let's go to your worksheet, if you will. I want to pull out two things uh, on the kingdom versus kingdom. Number one, I want to look at the battle of the two systems. The battle of the two systems. They're going to be up there. It's Jesus' kingdom consists of three areas. It consists of the religious, it consists of the political, and it consists of the economic. Those three things are the things that the kingdom of God, <clears throat> as we go through it, we're going to pull those out and look at them in succinct to each other. But the same thing on the other side is true. The king, Satan's kingdom consists of political, religious, and economic. So what you end up getting is you end up getting two kingdoms, which was the beginning of our study where we said there was two kingdoms, a kingdom versus another kingdom. And, under, and you're going to see this play out in the book of Revelation, and I will take you through it uh, tonight and kind of show you how they play out. But there is a political playing out of both kingdoms. There is a religious playing out of both kingdoms. And there is an economic, I talked about that a few months ago, and there's an economic playing out of both kingdoms. And it's not, it's not by mistake or by chance, it's on purpose. Because the ruler of this kingdom is what we will term to be known Christ, Jesus the Son of God in the flesh. And you will see things such as this, and you may have heard it, the Antichrist, and this is the ruler of Satan, ruling his kingdom. <clears throat> so both kingdoms, we have a type and an anti-type, a Christ and an anti-Christ, a political, religious, and economic system on one side and a political, economic, and religious system on the other side. This is why Lucifer is brilliant at religion. Uh, he has no problem mimicking everything God does. I do just want to tell you this as you look up here and we go through it, is that all, and we've said this before, but it bears repeating. It's, it's important to understand how the kingdom w works. Christ is an initiator. I want you to put that somewhere on your paper. I don't know if you can see it way back there in the back. But he's an initiator. Everything about the kingdom of God is initiative. In other words, it's a revelation. It comes from the mind of God first. What we mean by that is Satan cannot initiate anything new. He cannot create new, he cannot meet, make new. So what he is, he's not an initiator, but he's a responder, a reactor. Uh, he reacts to what God does. I've said this before, and it's an interesting thought when you think about it. Uh, the day of Pentecost, why were 3,000 people saved in one day, but it took th three years and Jesus could only muster up 120 that, that really makes you ponder when Jesus walking the planet only could muster up 120, but in one moment of time, 3,000 people get born again in a day. 
and 5,000 a few days later. 8,000 joined the church in less than a week and a half or so. And the beauty of that is because, this is my opinion, it's because uh, Lucifer's kingdom was not ready for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He did not know what was going on, and so he just had to respond. So when the Spirit was poured out on all flesh and the Spirit started drawing men to Jesus, Lucifer was having to be reactionary. This is why Lucifer really doesn't even show back up until Acts chapter 5 in the lie of Ananias and Sapphira. He figured out real quickly, if I can't beat him from the outside, I'll beat him from the inside. And uh, because he's a reactionary, uh, that was just a little side note for you. The kingdom versus kingdom, the political rule. Let's look at it. I want to look at Jesus' rule. <clears throat> and I want to take them all as we go through and look at them. The political rule of Jesus is the victorious, that's you and I. The victorious rule the nation, that's the church. Well, the church rules the nation. You say, well, how do you know it's the church? Turn in your Bible to Revelation, if you will. We're going to try to stay there a lot. Revelation chapter 2 and 3, 1, 2, and 3. Revelations chapter 2, listen to this. Revelations chapter 2, verse 26. To all who are victorious, this is to the church, right? You can get a worksheet. To all, to all who are victorious, all right? All of us in this room who are victorious, this is the church. To those who are victorious, watch what he says. He says, whoever <clears throat> obeys me to the very end, to them I will give authority over all nations. This is Revelation chapter 2, verse 26. I will give them authority over all nations to rule the nations with an iron, an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. They will have the same authority. Isn't that good? The same authority, not a lesser authority. They will have the same authority... I receive from my Father, I will give them. I love that. Isn't that awesome? Uh, so watch this now. If this is true, if the victorious church will rule the nations, that's political, then what do you think the Antichrist is going to do? He is going to call the rebellious to rule the nations. And we're going to pull this out in a minute. The rebellious will rule the nations when we get into the city of Babylon, which is where the political rule will take place. We'll pull that out in these two cities later. But that political city of Babylon is the home of the rebellious. So what Lucifer is going to set up is rebellion. This is why um, in the Old Testament it gives us an inference of rebellion. It says rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft. What that's intimating to us is that rebellion is rooted in deception and trickery. In other words, when you talk about the rebellious ruling the nation, it won't appear that they are rebellious. It will appear that they are righteous. They will look righteous. That's why uh, across the earth today, especially in our nation, there, there, are, there are doctrines and theologies that are starting to go through the church that are very rebellious, but they feel righteous. The only way you really know they're rebellious is not by logic, because logic says they're right. But the only way you know whether it is, it is rebellious or righteous is you have to go to the Word. And it is the Word of God that will tell us whether my ideologies and thinking are rebellious or righteous. This is why when we begin to water down the Word of God and when we begin to water what uh, the Word of God says, it becomes so detrimental to us. It becomes detrimental to the things God has. Let's look at the next one. It says this. It's the, it's the religious side of it. The political side of Satan is that the harlot will rule the nations. The rebellious, the harlot, that adulterous spirit. Uh, different from a bride, it's an adulterer. It's a prostitute. It, one version actually calls her a prostitute. That's the political side of Lucifer. I don't think it's, it, it's a you know, a, an interesting concept. As a matter of fact, let's do that. Let's turn to Revelation. Um, if you don't mind, Revelation chapter 17, just real quickly. Open your Bible so you can see it. Verse 1, One of the seven angels who had poured out the seven bowls spoke to me. Come with me, he said. I'll show you the judgment that's going to come upon the great prostitute who rules over many waters. And those are the nations. The kings of the earth have committed adultery with her, and the people who belong to this world have been made drunk with the wine of her immorality. In other words, this system over here, 
This system of the kingdom system is going to be a system that is governed by sensuality. This system is governed by obedient righteousness. This system is governed by unobedient or rebellious sensuality. And I just throw this to you, you know, I'm not a historian, but in my generation in the last 10 years, have we not seen an exponential rise of sensuality in movies, in, in the way we think, even in the laws we've passed in our nation? Uh, it's funny to me that we're now passing laws to justify sensuality. And don't think that that's just political. That's not just a political thing. It is a religious thing, a supernatural thing that is happening because we have to shift an entire nation to this way of thinking. And so as it begins to play out, it becomes interesting. The religious side is this. I love this. It's my favorite one. Jesus, the religious side of his kingdom says, you have to hear the Spirit. It's the only, it's, it's his side. If you go read Revelation, and we won't have time tonight, we've got an hour, but if you read Revelation chapter 2 and 3 to all seven churches, he says seven identical things. If you want to overcome, if you want to be victorious, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. This is critical to you and I. This is why some people can say, well, I read my Bible, but nothing's happening. Jesus didn't say if you read your Bible, you'll be victorious. He said if you'll hear the Spirit, you will be victorious. You can read your Bible all day long, but never hear the voice of the Spirit. You can be religious and sing all the right songs, but miss the voice of the Spirit. And so that's what you have to begin to say. And, you know, in this church, you hear me talk about that a lot because I'm so passionate in 1983, the Lord said, you'll teach my people healing in the Holy Spirit. So I'm very passionate about this. But this is the religious side of the kingdom. This is the religious side of, of, of Jesus. What do you think the religious side of the enemy is? It's going to be the same thing but opposite. You've got to hear the voice of the beast. Revelation chapter 13. Listen to this. Let's turn there because I really want you to go through your Bible and see it. It's talking about this religious system in Revelation chapter 13. <clears throat> and I want you to hear what it says. In, in Revelation 13, let me just give you the precursor so we won't read it all. But it's talking about a beast rising up out of a sea. It is a religious system that begins to rise up out of the sea. A political system begins to rise up out of the sea. Politics and religion begin to merge themselves together to rule the world. I've always said this, you cannot rule the world except you govern politics and religion. You have to have both of them. Why? Because almost, well, I'm not a historian, so let me don't say all. Most war, most war are usually fought because of political and religious agendas. For whatever reason they are. And so the merging of politics and religion has to happen. This is why when Jesus came down to the planet and began to walk, there was such a dichotomy between politics and religion, right? Politics was Caesar, the Romans, and they stayed separated. And then you had the religious of the Jews and the Sanhedrin. And, you know, and it was funny to watch it play out because it played out where they were, watch, they were dichotomized, right? And then they came together to kill him. So that is the beginning of the beast system where religion and, and politics come together to, defend, to defeat the redemptive work of Christ. So anytime you see politics starting to merge with religion, be careful on this planet because the next step is to defeat the redemptive work of Christ. It'll sound spiritual, but it won't be spiritual. Look at the next one. Economic. Oh, let me read it to you. Revelation 13. All right. And let's start reading in verse 11. I saw another beast come up from the earth. He had two horns like that of a lamb and spoke with the voice of a dragon. Is that not funny to you? Revelation 2 and 3 says that the spirit has a voice that speaks to the church. So Lucifer shows up and has a voice that speaks to the nations. It's, it's a profound thing. If Watch. If, if the voice of the spirit produces faith, then what would the voice of Lucifer produce? It would produce fear. So what do you see starting to happen in the minds of the world? Yeah, fear. 
the voice of the media, the voice of the world, the voice of disease, uh, Ebola virus, all the voices. You ever, you ever heard voices and just started feeling fearful? Like, oh my God, Ebola virus is about to get us. Oh my God, Zika virus is going to get me. You know, if you just cut your TV off and your social media off and never, never read, looked at the news, never read the newspaper, and just sat around your home and all, you'd probably never even be fearful. Amen. You'd probably be like, life's pretty good. I, I just got back from Cracker Barrel. It was great. <laughs> you know, I just had Coca-Cola chocolate cake. And then you turn on the news like, oh my God, we're going to hell. Like the whole world's blowing up. Oh my God, next time I go to Cracker Barrel, I'm taking a gun, you know? I mean, really, that's, don't think that this is just a political thing. This is a supernatural thing, and it's trying to produce fear in God's people. Uh, listen to what he said. I love how it ends, though. He goes on to say, he exercised all the authority of the first beast, and he required all of the earth and its people <clears throat> to worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. He did astounding miracles, even making fire flash down from earth. It's amazing that word, miracles. Uh, the religious is being merged into the political. He's doing miracles. And with all the miracles he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, he deceived all the people who belonged to the world. He ordered the people to make a great statue to the first beast who was fatally wounded and then came back to life. Now watch, here's a statue. Statues can't talk, right? I mean, they don't have a voice. But watch what he said. He then permitted... He was then permitted to give life to the statue so it could speak. That's crazy. Why? Because if the Spirit can speak through God's people and we are the express image of Jesus, then I will build a statue that is the express image of Lucifer and it will speak. If God's people can hear the voice of the Spirit and speak in lieu of Jesus then my statue can hear the voice of the dragon and speak in lieu of me. This will produce victorious faith. This will produce fear and rebellion. It's a brilliant thought. The next one is this, economic. How is it economic? Back to Revelation 2 and 3. Jesus said, I will write my name on you. I'll put my name on your forehead. I'll give you a brand new name. That in and of itself is economic. Because when something brands you, you belong to it. And that's an economic thing. That's why when you go to the grocery store, Coca-Cola has branded Coca-Cola. They own Coca-Cola. They put a registered trademark right there, meaning you can't steal it, you can't copy it, it's mine. This is what the Bible in Revelation 2 and 3, if you read it, those, those are, all of that is to the church. What Jesus says is, I'll give you a new name, and I'll write on you the name of my God, and I'll, I'll give you a brand, you know what I'm saying? I'll write your name in the book of life. What is he doing? Economically, he's saying you will no longer be an orphan. I will be your resource. In other words, I'm owning you. And if I own you economically, you never have to worry about a thing. I will be your food. I will be your drink. I will be your life. I will be your hope. I will be your healer. I will be your redeemer because I have marked you with my name. But the funny thing about it is, what does the kingdom of Lucifer do? The kingdom of Lucifer, he comes as well to put a mark on him. And uh, over here, Jesus said, I will give you a mark, and that mark will be my name, and it will be the name of Jesus, life. And over here, he says, I'm going to put a mark on your forehead, and it won't be the mark of Jesus, it will be the mark of man. It will be the mark of man. In other words, it, it will lend itself to, the best way I can define this, it will lend itself to pride rather than humility. It will be a mark of pride rather than humility. In other words, a mark that says, I, I have to have this in my own life versus the Father. And that's why when you read in, in the book of Revelation, you'll read that number 666. I mean, if you've watched you know, Hollywood, you've heard it. The number 666. All this is is a mark that is placed upon all the people who will bow down and worship Satan. I've had people ask me, this is just a thought for you, I've had people say, well, well what if I take the mark, will I know it? Yes, because the mark is given when you have to bow down and worship. So you won't get caught by taking it like, I didn't know I took it. 
Like I've had people say, well, the RFID chip that they put in your hand or your forehead to track your dog, and they now can track you. That's not the mark of the beast because GPS is not worship of Satan. So, but this technology will be used to track the world and those who buy and sell because he said if you don't receive this mark on your head, you cannot buy and sell. If you don't bow down and work, this is economic. If you don't bow down to worship me, you'll never buy and you will never sell. In other words, he who owns the money owns you. He who owns the food and water owns you. So it becomes a critical uh, mishap. Let's look at the next two things I want to pull out. It's the battle of two women. We won't talk about it long, but you will read about it in the book of Revelation, and therefore I just like to would comment so when you read you understand. Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 17 and 18. Revelation 12 it introduces us to a woman, which is the nation of Israel, the mother of Jesus, God's people, the Jews. So in the book of Revelation, you're, when you read God's people, this is my opinion, you're reading about God's people, the Jews, uh, not God's people, the church. The church is always referred to as the church, not just God's people, but we're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who belong to God, the church, the body, we are one, but now when we come over here, we find that there are still people in the book of Revelation, and that's what throws us. Like, who's, who are these people? We're going to talk about them a little bit. Who are all the people in Revelation? And we just naturally assume, well, it's Christians and non-Christians, right? Now, who else is here? Christians and non-Christians. But that's a misinterpretation of how Scripture is laid out. As I said last week, there are several groups going on. There's Christians, those that are the body of Christ, who belong to Christ, he is the head, and we are the body. Then there are those who don't belong to Christ, and those are the nations of the world, Gentile nations, sinner nations, anyone who doesn't know Christ. And then there are the Jews, which are the people of God, chosen by God via Abraham, and the promise given to Abraham, there's those. And the strange thought to that is, read the book of Romans, it said that because of the Jews' rejection of this, because of the Jews' rejection, well, let me draw this too, because I thought this was a good thought I had today uh, concerning that, about the Jews and the Gentiles and these two kingdoms. So I'm going to put them right in the middle. Here are the Gentiles, which is every other person other than a Jew. All right, And now out of these two groups can come the church, of course, but there are two distinct nations. These chosen by God, Abraham, he chose them. And then the Gentiles, all of the other nations you read about who aren't the Hebrews and the Jews. Here's an interesting thought. The Jews belong to God, right? They belong to him. He chose them so they, they belong. The Gentiles don't belong to God. They are not his people. That's why in the Old Testament he, you couldn't marry. You couldn't intermarry with non-people that weren't us. You can't intermarry with them. That's not about racism. It's about a kingdom thing. So it's not, you know, I, I know racists teach that that's racism. This was not about racism. This was about ownership. My kingdom versus the kingdoms of the world. Now watch how Satan plays this. To the Jews who already belong because of his choosing... Lucifer plays on them to cause them to reject Christ. To the Gentiles who don't belong, he pulls on them to not accept Christ. To those who already belong, he says reject it. To those who don't belong, he says don't accept it. And you see this in the New Testament. When Jesus shows up, his own reject him, right? And the Gentiles don't accept him. They're like, he's, he's a son of the devil. He's just crazy. But what you do see as well is you see some Jews, Nicodemus, accepting that I belong and I'm part of this new Jesus kingdom. And you see some Gentiles coming in to follow him. You see, you know, the Samaritan woman start believing 
It's an interesting concept when you think about this rejecting and belonging because the enemy's working on it and these groups show up in the book of Revelation. Let's go on now and look at the next issue that shows up. It's the mother, the harlot. We're going to look at this in depth in just a moment. The battle of the two women. The next woman you're going to see in Revelation, she will be deemed the harlot, the mother of harlot, the Gentile world system, and all false religions. This is an entire system of politics that's laden with religion. I'll just tell you something in a minute. That, you know, give you a little thought here. We, we are going to look at it in Babylon in just a moment. This is an interesting thought. The reason Christians are hated by other religions is not because we're narrow-minded and think our God is the best God and Jesus is the only way and we're just a bunch of narrow-minded people and then other religions come along and say, you have to be kidding me. Y'all think you're the only ones that are going to get to God? We go, we say, yes, there's only one way to the Father, Jesus. And they go, well, that's arrogant. I believe you mean my religion won't get me to God. And then someone like Oprah comes on TV and says, all religions lead to God. You know, and then that really confuses us because, wow, Oprah knows and, and, and she believes. So therefore, I mean, I was watching the TV show when she said it and it really kind of took me back. But the beauty of that is all, all religions do lead to God, but once you get there, it doesn't mean you'll be accepted. Because it's only belief in Jesus that once you get there, gets you accepted. So I don't mind people saying all religions lead to God, but once you get there, if you don't know Christ, you won't be accepted. And that sounds unfair, right? Favor is not fair, but the beauty of that is, Jesus even said, wide is the way to destruction, narrow is the way to life. Many are called, but few are chosen. So even Jesus understood this concept that he would be the only way to life but I, I want you to look at that word false religions there. As you glance on that, that for a moment, I want you to ponder this in false religions. <clears throat> the thing about it, the reason we're hated is because we will be singled out as the true body of Christ and where we would think all other religions would equally hate each other, they won't. All other religions will, will gather together under this false system. Which is why I say all the false religions can't gather together until you get the one out. The one true religion. And that does sound arrogant if somebody's listening to me. It sounds arrogant that we say Christianity is a one true religion. But I didn't write that. I'm just communicating that to you. It wasn't like I got in my bedroom and thought my Christian belief is the only way. Uh, I, I got in my bedroom with my Bible and it said it was the only way. And so therefore, it's the only way. Whether I agree with it or not, or think it's narrow-minded or not, it's still the only way. So therefore, what you're going to see is a separation of Christianity from other religions. We will never be able to be ecumenical. I know it feels good. Let's get all the religions of the world together. And let's sing Kumbaya and hold hands. We can all do it until we say we serve the only God the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and there is no other way to be saved but by Him, they will let go of your hands. And you will be isolated and alone. So when we see all the religions of the world coming together singing Kumbaya over Mother Earth, just know this, you will not fit in that equation. Unless you keep your mouth shut and pretend like it doesn't matter to you. But, but yes, it does matter. Uh, the Babylon system, let's look now at the two cities. We're going to pick up two cities. You're getting all the twos that are coming out. It's because there's a Christ and an Antichrist. There's two cities. Babylon, we're going to look at right now, the great whore. I know that's a horrible name. But, but the beauty of that is, it's what I want you to pick out when you think of the term whore. Zero amount of covenant. No relationship whatsoever. This is why what you're going to see start happening in the body of Christ if we're not careful and we keep our ears tuned to the Holy Spirit, the whorish spirit will come through a church. And a whorish spirit, a harlotry spirit, a whorish spirit will make it about themselves, about their own pleasure. They will refuse to be in covenant and they will refuse to have relationship. 
Because that's what marriage is, right? Marriage is a covenant relationship where I have to die to me so we can live. And then the wife says, and I have to die to me so we can live. But the harlotry or his spirit that is being loose says, no, it is about me. And you need to die so I can live. And, and, it, and, it, and I don't want to do relationship with you. I just want to sit in a corner and just mind my own business. You mind your business. You mind your business and leave me alone. Uh, that cannot work in the body of Christ because we're called to be in relationship with one another because it's in relationship, it's in the light, as He is in the light, that we realize the cleansing power of the blood of Christ. Right? The cleansing power of the blood. Number two, let's look at what this city is all about. Go to Revelation chapter 17. I want to read you about the city, so turn there if you will. I'm just going to read and we'll read along together. Verse 1, one of the seven angels who had poured out the seven bowls came over and spoke to me. Come with me, he said, and I will show you judgment that is going to come upon the great prostitute, watch, who rules over many waters. We'll find out in a minute that those waters are actually nations. So this prostitute rules over the nations. This spirit of harlotry moves, rules over all the nations of the earth. The kings of the world have committed adultery with her, and the people who belong to this world have been made drunk with the wine of her immorality. So there'll be that uh, you'll see immorality on the rise. True or false? Yeah, immorality will begin to rise. Uh, so the angel took me into the spirit. And, well, let me throw this to you. Have you ever wondered why we're getting more religious but more immoral? Does that not kind of make you want to scratch your head and go, "How are we getting more religious?" But we're getting more immoral as we're getting more religious. Church is popping up on every corner, but immorality in America is at an all-time high. Again, it's not just because the girl likes to sex her parts. It's because a spirit is working that, that causes us to begin to accept immorality. And it causes us to begin to, uh, to not disdain the immoral ways of life, but to accept them. Watch, watch how brilliant Lucifer is. You need to accept immorality on the basis of love. Why? Because God is love, and I want to be God, but His love produces righteousness. My love produces immorality, so I will tell you to love immorality to embrace all people. It just doesn't work. But He wants to be God, and so He produces... Now watch, this is funny. We think that Lucifer... Because he's the devil is all about hate. Just hate you. Which is true. But the way he woos the world is not via hate. He woos you through lust. And lust is connected to love. So it's just a, lust is a fake love. It, it, is a, it feels like love. Like, ooh, it, feels, it sometimes feels better than love. But, but the reality of it is all he's doing is just playing against the God of love that moves me to righteousness He's the God of love that moves me to immorality. He causes me to accept holiness. He causes me to accept immorality. So once you hear people start saying, I can live any way I want to, and because you have to love me, that's the spirit of Lucifer. Yes, we love you, but we don't love the immorality. And we can still speak against the immorality and love you at the same time. Right? I mean, I mean that's just... We don't have to judge you, but at the same time, because me loving you doesn't mean I give a carte blanche nod of approval over your immorality okay and sometimes that's kind of the way it's presented like you have to love me meaning don't mess with my junk but if you're in the body of Christ people gonna mess with your junk because we're called to spur each other on to holiness and to obedience it's the only way we really know is to be in this thing together the Babylon the whore of Revelation 17 let's keep reading rules over uh, and in her hand, let's jump on down to verse 4. The woman wore the pure purple and scarlet, jewelry made of gold, precious gems and pearls. It's amazing how beautiful she is. In her hand, she held a gold goblet full of obscenities and impurities of her immoralities. And again, I would just like to tell you, uh, if you don't believe obscenities are on the rise, um, just go to the movies. <laughs> obscenities are on the rise. <laughs> Uh, got a brand new movie out called Sal Sausage Party. And uh, I thought it was just a cartoon at first. So I Googled it and did my, did my homework. Thank God I did my homework. 
but it's just basically an immoral cartoon. Uh, so, so do know this, that, that even though we may think that you know, we, can get, we can skirt around it, immorality is on the rise, and that is a Babylonian system of whoredom that's here. Watch, it says this as we read on. It says, and she held a goblet, verse 5, a mysterious name was written on her forehead. I'd have to get mom to take you here because that's kind of uh, out of my league. I hadn't really studied that out, why it's called a mysterious name. But a mysterious name was written on her forehead, Babylon the Great, mother of all prostitutes, obscenities in the world. How would you like that to be the name of your mom? <laughs> Babylon, mother of all prostitutes and obscenities in the whole world. And I could see she was drunk with the blood of God's holy people who were witnesses for Jesus. Let me tell you what this is. This is a disdain for the people of God. There will become a disdain over this world for, for those who claim to be God's people. They will hate you with vile. They just won't ignore you. They will hate you with vile, vitreous hatred, obscenities. They will call you names. They will, they will persecute you. You know, I hadn't come to America quite yet, but it is around the rest of the world as the world begins to become obscene. Let's, let's pull it out and see who this Babylon is. Babylon comes from the original builder in Genesis chapter 10. If you want to read it, it just kind of takes the names of Noah's sons and then it kind of gives a genealogy of their names. But in there, the, the builder, the initial builder of Babylon, where the Tower of Babel came out of, the initial builder, his name was Nimrod. That name means rebellion. So this city, I talked about it a little bit last time, but this city that, that, whose builder began to build this city, <clears throat> and he built a tower that we're very familiar of in the Christian world, the Tower of Babel. But the builder of that city <clears throat> was a descendant of Noah, and his name means rebellion. Now, I haven't really looked at the history of the length of time. I, I should have, but the length of time between the ark and the length of time between the Tower of Babel. Noah was still alive. We do know that. But it is, it is amazing to me that Noah was a man of righteousness, but once Lucifer saw what the obedience of Noah could do to redeem humanity back, in his lineage came the blood relative of Noah who is now known to be rebellion. Does that not just make you scratch your head? Noah's known for obedience, but Nimrod, his offspring, is known for rebellion. Noah builds an ark to save uh, the redemptive work of God and uh, Nimrod builds a tower in the name of himself and the people to reach to the heavens to worship themselves. It's an amazing concept as we see it playing out. Nimrod means rebellion, Genesis 10. Babylon, Revelation chapter 17, 18. Uh, I'll give you some more scriptures there. I would encourage you to read them for the sake of time we won't, but it's good Bible reading. Isaiah 47 especially. It's all about the city of Babylon. If you want to know what it's like, what the characteristics of the city are like, I mean, it, it is the antithesis of God's city. It is the exact opposite of the way the city of God is. Isaiah 47. Uh, it, it is a, <clears throat> the seat of wickedness and rebellion. Number three. She's full and drunk on the blood of the saints. Is it not funny that both of these kingdoms have blood mentioned to them. One is the blood of Christ that is poured out for the redemption of man, and the other is the blood of the saints that is poured out for the vitreous hatred of Lucifer. Still got blood. So it's the blood of the saints versus the blood of the, of the Son. Babylon, Revelation chapter 18, is a political center. My belief, I don't know, I mean, I've, I've got several, so I'll throw it out and let you ponder it. Uh, some beliefs are that it's the real Babylon over in Iraq today that we talk about, that that city will get a revival and will become the city of, uh, of harlotry. And, and I don't think, you know, I, I'm not going to go there. and I'll let you figure that out. But that is a, a thought. But in that thought, is it not funny that in the Middle East where this happens, there is a rise of Islamic belief in religion? the religion of Islam that begins to come out uh, uh, into those that practice in that area. The other 
the other thing about Babylon, if you read Re- Revelation 17 and 18, it says that it, it will rule and reign on the city of seven hills. And a lot of people believe that that is Rome. That the Roman Empire will be revived again like it was years ago and an entire Roman Empire will rise, which right now is the seat of Catholicism, so there's religion, the Vatican right in the middle of it, but out of that religious system, a political system will rise, and so people debate that. I'll let you debate it on your own. But there will be a ruling city. Right now we have nations that rule, you know, America rules, Europe, you know, whatever, we all rule. But in the Revelation, a city rules, not nations, a city And the reason is, is because in a moment we're going to read about the new Jerusalem, which is a city. Lucifer sees that Jesus has a city. He wants a city. So this is everything Jesus does. His people rule the nations. My people rule the nations. He gets a city. So do I. And I'll just really encourage you with this. Isaiah 47, Revelation 17 and 18. Read all three of them. Make a characteristic list of the city of Babylon Then go over and read Revelation 21 and 22 and look at the characteristics of this new city, Jerusalem, the the bride, and watch the difference. They are diabolically opposite of one another. A city of Lucifer, political, religious, and economic, and a city of God, political, religious, and economic. Both vying to rule the earth. It's an interesting concept. The next city is this. It is the new Jerusalem. And I think it's an interesting concept. Rather than being a harlot, it's a beautiful bride. You've probably heard this, that we are the bride of Christ. And we can debate who that really is. But but it is a Christian New Testament concept. This is why on this side of the kingdom, we see words like bride. And then over here, we see the word harlot. I would just like you to ask yourself to... Make a mental note of what are the differences between the two. Can you notice a difference between a hooker and a bride? Can you notice a difference between a harlot and a bride? Are they clear to you? Uh, On the surface, uh, we can fake it. We can dress the harlot up to look like a bride. Right? It's easy to do. This is now, because watch, when we think harlot, we think... uh, You know, we think just right up the road. You know, right past Six Flags. And we think high pants, makeup, high heel shoes, breast, low cut shirt, street walker, right? That's what we think when we say harlot. We think street walker. But if you go back and read about the city of Babylon, which is the political city of the harlot, it is not the typical imagery of a hooker it is the imagery of a gorgeous bride so what you're going to see happen are two religious systems that look almost identical to each other but in the heart of this one is harlotry and in the heart of this one is humility this is why Jesus said the only way you will know them is by their fruit They'll look just alike. I don't know if you've ever bumped into someone who claimed to know Jesus and you hung out with them for about a month and thought, they don't know the same Jesus I know. Right? But they look like they knew. They said they knew. They said the right things. So I just want you, as you read this word harlot and as you go through this and you're, you're reading about the harlotry here, I want you to understand, don't take the image of a street walker. Take the image of a beautiful bride who's faking it. It's her wedding day, but she just had sex with her best man in the basement. It's her wedding day, but she's got a boyfriend waiting on her when she gets back from her honeymoon. That's the picture you have to get. It is a heart issue, not a clothing issue. So this is what we're seeing in America. We're we're starting to look at the outward things and appealing that more than to the heart. You know them by their heart, and that's an important thing. It's why we have to come and know the Lord. This is helping you? All right. Let's look at the two nations. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but it will help you understand as you read. There are two nations that are talked about in the Bible. 
uh, and they're separated at the millennial reign of Christ. Matthew chapter 25, I believe it is in your scripture. Let's turn there and read it. Matthew chapter 25. A lot of times, this is taken out of context. And it's pre preached to us like it's Christians. Good Christians versus bad Christians. A goat Christian versus a sheep Christian. But these are not Christians. These are nations. And they're identified by how they treated the Jews. And those that treat the Jews good get to inherit the kingdom of God in this system over here where we are in the millennial reign, the thousand year reign where Christ is ruling, they get to inherit that. They get to come in. So let's just read it. Matthew chapter 25 in verse uh, 31. But when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit upon the glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered in His presence and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. So what I want you to understand is sheep and goats are not Christians. They're nations. They're not the church. Because when he comes back, he doesn't separate the church. You are his. <laughs> you belong to him. You're one with him. So he wouldn't separate himself. These are nations that are there. And he begins to separate them. Sheep to, to one, goats to the left. And then he says this, Then the king will say to those on his right, those are the sheep, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you for the creation of the world. So this is that millennial kingdom reign in the book of Revelation. I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you invited me home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. And I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison or and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it not to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. And the king will turn to those on his left and say, away with you. Watch, this just show you it can't be Christians. Cursed. If you're a Christian, you're not cursed. You've been delivered from the curse. Come on, amen? amen? In Galatians 3, you've been delivered. So this can't be a Christian. You cursed ones into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. Watch, that's important. This can't be Christians because the only people that can go to the lake of fire, we'll look at this in a moment, are people who don't have their name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And Christians have their names in the Lamb's Book of Life. So again, I don't think this is Christians, it's nations. And then he goes through the same thing and they ask when, when. And he said, well, you didn't do it to me and because you didn't do it. He said, I tell you the truth, verse 45. When you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers, you were refusing to help me and they will go away into eternal punishment. But the righteous into eternal life. That is a profound concept. That there is going to come a day on this nation on this planet where Jesus' feet will touch down on this planet and He will gather all the nations of the world to Him as a King of kings and Lord of lords. And He will take the nations here that have treated the Jews fairly during the tribulation and He will take these here who didn't treat them fairly and all of these go into everlasting punishment. It's a crazy thought. And then all of these nations get to come into this millennial kingdom. Have you ever asked yourself, who are we going to rule and reign when we get there if we're all Christians? Rule and reign each other? That would feel good. I've always wanted to rule some people, right? Especially those I don't like, you know. You've got to listen to me now, you know. No, the church rules and reign over what? Nations that are left here after it's all said and done. Who came in, who are not redeemed yet, who are not born again yet, who have never accepted Christ yet, but just because they treated God's people well, God says, well, I'll let you inherit the kingdom. And then they come in and get to live, my opinion, in unredeemed bodies, unlike the church that have redeemed bodies, and for a thousand years they will marry, have babies, grow and multiply, uh, do all that they do, and we, the church, rule and reign over them. Uh, it's, a, it's a profound concept at the end of the thousand years. Watch this now. Um, those who treated the Jews fairly are the sheep. 
And those who treated them unfairly are the goats. Those who treated them fairly are the sheep. And those who treated the Jews unfairly are the goats. Let's talk about uh, two resurrections. I am not going to spend a lot of time on this. I just want to pull it out. You'll read about resurrection in the Bible. There's a first resurrection. And the first resurrection is the resurrected saints in the rapture and those that believe in Jesus Christ. The dead in Christ rise first. And those of us that are alive and remain come up. If you read it through the book of Revelation, you'll see that those that were beheaded come up. Now, let's, matter of fact, let's just turn there and read it. Uh, Revelation chapter 20. I want you to read it. It's an interesting thought because it's called the first resurrection. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 20 verse 1. I saw an angel coming down from heaven in the key of the bottomless pit in his hand. He seized the dragon, the old serpent, who's the devil, Satan, who, and he bound him in chains for a thousand years. The angel threw him into a bottomless pit, which he then shut and locked so Satan could not deceive the nations anymore. There it is, that deception of nations. Why lock him up? Why lock him up if there's no nations here to deceive? So there are nations here to deceive. These nations cannot be the church because you've already been redeemed, right? So that, that's the truth of the Holy Spirit. The angel threw him into a bottomless pit. He was there until a thousand years were finished, and afterward he was released for a little while. If you've ever wondered why, why would God, Jesus, lock Lucifer up, a, the, the Satan, a thousand years, and then let him free. But my Lord, just keep him down there. We're doing cool. Because we cannot enter the end of the thousand year reign and go into the eternal realm of God. We cannot enter in here into this eternal state except every human back here that has been born gets an opportunity to receive him. Because he will not step into eternity and force anyone. So Lucifer is allowed to come and tempt all the people who were born during this thousand years who have never been tempted. Who have never known what it's like to be tempted to follow Lucifer. You would think living under the kingdom of God for a thousand years, you wouldn't even worry about being tempted. But my belief from what I studied is even though there's no pain, no sickness, no death, and no sorrow, these nations will despise Jesus. Why? Because they've never been redeemed. And they, they don't want to be ruled by you. They didn't want to, you know, they, they, it's just like it is now. So, but we will be ruling and reigning. And so Lucifer comes back and tempts them. Let's see, well... If it really was a great thing and they were all Christians, nobody would be deceived, but let's see what it happens. He says this, Afterward, he must be released for a little while, and I saw thrones and people sitting that had been given authority to judge and the souls of them and their testimony of Jesus, proclaiming the word that they had not worshipped the beast or his statue, accepted his mark on their forehead and their hands. They came to life again and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. This is the first resurrection. There it is, the first resurrection. Then verse 7, When the thousand years come to an end, Satan will be let out of his prison. He will go around to deceive the nations called Gog and Magog in every corner of the earth. He will gather them together for battle, a mighty army as numberless as the sand along the seashore. How? If you've lived under the rule of Christ a thousand years, how could there be a, a number like the sand of the seashores that are going to turn on him? There's been no disease, no death, no hatred, no nothing. And, and the reality of what's going on is that Lucifer comes to do exactly what he's wanted to do. He's wanted to be God and he's going to deceive them that they have been under the tyranny and dictatorship of a, watch, of a selfish of a selfish, manipulative, baby-killing God. And I have come to redeem you out of the tyranny of this theocracy called God. And as numerous as the sand of the seashores, 
they begin to gather together to overthrow Christ. And it says, And I saw them, and they went up on the broad plain of the earth, surrounded by God's people in the beloved city. But fire from heaven came down on, attacking the armies, and consumed them. The devil who had been deceived was thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet, and there will be tormented day and night forever. Moving now into the two deaths at the very bottom. We have the resurrection of the dead, now the two deaths. The second resurrection is the resurrection of the dead that we're going to read now. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. I saw a great white throne and one sitting on it. That's God. The earth and sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, recorded into the books. In other words, you will not be able to declare yourself innocent because he will judge you based on what you've done. And it's already been written down. So it's guilty right in front of you. And it says this, they will be judged according to what they've done. The sea gave up its dead and death and the grave gave up their dead and all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death and anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is a real place and it's called the second death. It's a death that comes because it's the separation from God's presence. The first death is when you lose your life here on this earth and then you go to either be with God or you go to wait this judgment. The second death is a death that comes when you're totally separated from God forever and there's no more hope. It's why it's called the second death because there is no resurrection up from it. It is final and it's done forever into the lake of fire. It's an interesting concept. I want you to ponder this. Look at verse 20, chapter 21, verse 1. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and, and the sea was gone. I just want to give you something. For those of you that love to study, this is a great study. I've studied it myself, so I'll just kind of throw it out there, whet your appetite, you can study it. Why in the new heaven and the new earth would there be no ocean? Why would there be no sea? It's my belief that the ocean we see now is a judgment upon the kingdom of Lucifer. And I believe that hell and the place of the dead is under the ocean. That's why the Bible says, and the sea gave up its dead. I believe, this is just an opinion, I believe that when a Christian dies, they immediately go to be into the presence of Jesus. And we bury their body to await a resurrection. When a sinful person dies... We bury their body just right. We bury their body just like a saved one. But their spirit does not go to be with the Father in Jesus. I believe their spirit goes to hell. Hell is not the lake of fire. Hell is the place of the dead. It's where all the dead are gathered together to wait for judgment. When we think hell, we think a place of fire, right? Hell, fire, <laughs> you know. Hell is different than the lake of fire. Hell is the place and the abode of the dead. It's where all the dead go that do not know God and they are held in chains until the day of judgment. And on the day of judgment, the Bible says, I, hear what we just read, I saw the sea give up its dead. It's my belief that, uh, it's just a belief, you don't have to believe it. I think the souls of dead people who do not know God are held in the deep, dark recesses of the earth under the ocean. Uh, I believe that's why we've never gone to the middle of the earth. I do know in your science books when you were in the third grade you saw a beautiful picture of the earth cut in half and there's the beautiful orange core of the earth. Uh, just let me help you here. It's a lie. Nobody's ever been there. About the furthest we've ever drilled down is about 30 miles I think. So don't even think that everybody who's telling you what the middle of the earth core looks like, lava and hot nose, nobody's ever been there. We can barely drill down far enough. And just to help you out, we've gone to the moon 
and we've explored the universe, but we can't even go to the bottom of the ocean. Figure that one out. How can we go to the moon and we can't get somebody on the floor of the bottom of the ocean because it's so deep? That's just my thought for you. I believe it's because God never intended us to go there. That's why we can't explore the, the total dark depths of the ocean's complete bottom. Uh, it goes on to say this, those that believe in Jesus, the two deaths are this. It's the death of those who believe in Jesus will be raised to life. Is the first is the first death, those that believe to Jesus and they die, they go to life. And then the second death is those who do not believe and have their part in the lake of fire. Those are the two deaths. My first death, I know Jesus, I'm resurrected. But the second death is a total separation from God. And let me just end with a thought. If you'll turn in your Bible to, Jeru uh, to Revelation chapter 21, verse 5. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I'm making everything new. Hallelujah for that. And he said to me, Write this down. What shall I tell you is trustworthy and true? And he said, It's finished. I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely of the springs of water of life. And all who are victorious will inherit all these blessings. And I will be their God and they will be my children. Watch, this is important. I'm going to end with this thought and we'll be done. But... Cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, the murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur, which is the second death. There it is again. Is everybody with me? Let's read who's in there again. Cowards, unbelievers, corrupt, murderers, immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and liars, their fate's a lake burning with fire. This is the second death. If you don't mind, turn over to Revelation chapter 22 now. Or Revelation chapter 21 and we'll read into verse in chapter 22. Verse 24 talking about the city. The nations of the world will enter the city in their glory. Its gates will never be closed at the end of the day because there's no night there. And all the nations will bring their glory and honor into that city. That's the new Jerusalem we talked about. Nothing evil will ever be allowed to enter, nor anyone who practices shameful idolatry and dishonesty, but only those who are written. Where are those that practice idolatry at? They're in the lake of fire, right? All right, so that's why they can't come into the city. They're in the lake of fire. So they won't be allowed into the city. Revelation chapter 22, and this is an interesting concept, <clears throat> and let's, let's read it. Verse 14 of Revelation 22. Blessed are those who wash their robe, they will be permitted to enter through the gates of the city and eat the fruit of the tree of life. Outside the city are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, and the murderers, the idol worshipers, and all who love to lie. Where are those people? In the lake of fire, right? But the Bible says that that lake of fire is outside the city. It's my belief, it's my belief, that the lake of fire will be visible for all of eternity. That we will see the lake of fire burning outside the city as a reminder of what rebellion is. As a reminder of what happens when you try to rebel against the Son of God. Again, this, this could be debatable. You can debate it. It's fine. You don't have to believe it. But it is something I would just challenge you to think about. The dogs, the adulterers, the liars, the idolaters, all of, the, all of that are in the lake of fire. But then that says, but that's right outside the city. And it's just my belief that for all of eternity, as we enter into the eternal realm of God and we move forward with God, that there will be a fire burning as a reminder of the grace of God and the punishment of rebellion. Hope that helped you. Let's pray.